read together from the Bible now, and uh, Men is going to come and lead us. Thank you, Mena. The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 39 and finishing at verse 55. Mary visits Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Mary's Song And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him, from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has, lifted, he has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Let's... Um we we'll pray for Esther as she comes to speak. Let me go over there. Okay. <laughs> Organized we are. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the message that you laid on Esther's heart. And we pray for her as she delivers it now in Jesus' name that she will hear from you as she speaks to us. And we pray for ourselves as we listen that we will hear what you're saying to us and what we need to do. Come now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's my absolute pleasure to be with you today and to see, I say, all of your lovely faces. There aren't many of us here, but um, it's lovely to see you and to be with you. I've been missing being at West End, but it's been also fun going and experiencing some other churches too. And thank you, Mena, for the reading. And today we're going to be thinking about Mary's song that she sings um, upon finding out that she's pregnant and that the Messiah is coming. I don't know if maybe it would have made Christmas number one at the time. Who knows? Maybe not enough snowmen. So we've heard the reading, and that is the encounter where Mary and Elizabeth meet. And then Mary has this amazing song that she sings, an excitement for her leads to this singing and I was thinking this morning and I've chosen a different song a very different song just for us to listen to um, I'm gonna hopefully it will work if we get up the PowerPoint so brace yourself it's gonna be very different
Now, this isn't my musical taste, you might be glad to know, but um, I was reading a book about the Incarnation and someone called Michael Quick was pointing this out as quite a depressing social commentary on life. These words, we're dancing on the escalator of life. We won't be happy till we have it all. And I don't let the guilty feeling shake me. You can have your cake and eat it, baby. And I don't know if anybody here watches or has seen The Apprentice. Yes, yeah, you're a fan, David. Some, Richard, yeah. Ian's not a big fan. I quite like it. But it's, it's pretty depressing, right? You get these people and they're all fighting for Lord Sugar's money and then his investment of his great business strength in their business. And what you get is the very first few weeks, these introductions they have and little videos of them saying, I will stamp on anybody who comes in my way or what other things, and they might say things like, Watch out, anybody who um, is competing against me, I'm the best, I'll knock everybody out of the competition. Usually the people who say those the most tend to go in the first few weeks. But it's this kind of question or this suggestion of it's like a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? This human success ladder that people are desperate to be climbing up. Now, we're going to be thinking about this picture of an escalator today, but I don't need to think like a small escalator, maybe if you're in Wilco's in Trowbridge and there's the little escalator that goes down to the marketplace or the nice escalator in Tesco's where you get to glide up, don't even have to, you know, there's no steps. I want you to maybe think in your mind of one of the tallest escalators you've ever been on. I don't know if you've been in the underground and sometimes you find yourself going further and further down to the underground. There's absolutely huge escalators or maybe at the airport, somewhere where you kind of feel like you want to hold on to the side to steady yourself. That's the kind of escalator I want us to have in our minds this morning. But we're going to use this escalator as a picture of human success and the striving for power and the, yeah, just climbing up. And we can imagine there is an escalator just full of people, people trying to make something of themselves, going up, not worrying about who they're stepping on on the way. It's a picture of um, being after success, maybe of being after money, of power, of significance. And there is this human tendency that we put ourselves first. It's like human nature that says, look out for ourselves and maybe those who we love. And we see these attitudes all around, maybe in the corporate ladder um, with people trying to get promotions Giant corporations cramming out smaller independent companies from the market to, to hold on to a majority share. People who are out trying to make money from human trafficking. And we see the migrants coming over, don't we? And how they give all of their money. It goes into the pockets of someone who doesn't even probably care about their safety, but is just trying to um, make money where they can. And this escalator of life is a case of the more you earn, the more successful you are, the higher you go up, the happier you will be. And this is what society tells us. But I want you to picture your escalator again. But what I want you to do is imagine you're looking to the very, very top. And at the top, you can see Jesus. Now, this isn't because Jesus has gone up on the escalator. And in fact, I want us to think about it being the opposite. So if you cast your minds back to a story in Genesis of the Tower of Babel, and the people are building a tower. I'll read what it says. They say, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Now, God had other ideas about that. And his response was, and I love this, he came down, came down to their tall tower that they were building up to the heavens. He came down to look at it, like, oh, look, at your little tower down there. I see what you're trying to do. And so what I want us to think about is when Jesus is at the top of the escalator, that's not where he began. He's already made the descent, as we hear about in Mary's song, from his heavenly throne to the top of this escalator 
where we are trying to strive for success and for power as human beings. But what we want you to do is just imagine Jesus stepping across to the other side and he begins to travel down. As he's traveling down, he passes people, maybe he smiles at them, maybe waves, maybe looks on to them with compassion. And we have this story of our downward motion from Jesus in our reading today with Mary's song. It's into this depressing dog-eat-dog world that a tiny baby comes quietly into the night. But Mary knows the significance of this event. And just before, with her visit with Elizabeth, the angel gives these words to her, Jesus, he will be great. He will be the son of the Most High. He will have the throne of David. His kingdom will never end. He will be called the Son of God. And this realization causes her to burst into song. I don't know if any of you have had such good news that you're ready to start singing about it, but for Mary, this was amazing news. She had been waiting for the Messiah, as had all the Jewish people. They were waiting, they were longing for someone to come and rescue them. And she would have known the promises from Isaiah 6. This promise is that the Messiah would bring good news to the oppressed. That he would bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and release to prisoners. And Mary, the amazement that she must have had that she was to play a part, and not a small part, she was to have a significant part as she grew and carried the saviour of the world. And maybe she was thinking that she wasn't the clearest of choices. Maybe the daughter of a pharaoh might have been better, could have had some financial security or some significance through a powerful title. Maybe the daughter of a Pharisee or people who were in that community. Maybe someone who was, yeah, who could have given him the platform that would have helped him start his ministry in a different way. Maybe she was also wondering why the Messiah would be born into the line of Israelites. We might ask why God chose the Israelites to bring his son into these people because they were of no significance, the Israelites at the time. The Egyptians, they had amazing culture. Rome had cosmopolitan character. The Greeks had philosophers. Babylon had mighty warriors. The Israelites were insignificant, but that is who God chose to send his son to. And this incarnation story shows the upside-down nature of the kingdom of God. This is not human endeavors or human attempts for success. Jesus was not seeking after power. He had all power up in heaven. He gave away his power. And we see this in Mary's song. The opponents of Jesus in this song are those who are grasping for social respect and places of honour. It talks about the proud being scattered, the powerful brought down from their thrones, the rich sent away empty. But what it does teach her and what she sees in this story, in her loneliness, her loneliness as just an unknown young woman, a woman who had no status at the time, yet she was chosen. And she says about this in her song, that God came to the lowly. He was going to promise to lift up people like her to fill the hungry, to bring help to Israel, to save the world. And this was all according to his grace and his love for the world, not for any benefit of his own. And Jesus doesn't stop halfway down this escalator. He goes down to the very bottom, to the lowest 
of the low. A bit like with the activity we were doing earlier, he chooses the dirty stable. He is born where the animals are. I mean, you don't have babies where animals are. You try and find somewhere clean to have a baby. But he comes to the lowest of the low and to those who are insignificant, to one of the least significant people groups in the world at the time, to show that this is who our God is like. He loves the oppressed. He loves the poor. He loves everybody. But what he wanted to show was that this world is not about success. It's about his love, and it is about sacrifice, and it is about emptying of ourselves. And this loneliness didn't just take place with the incarnation. We see it throughout Jesus' life and ministry. He dines with tax collectors. He meets with prostitutes. His best friends are fishermen. This was a loneliness that was to continue. He talks about the first becoming last and the last becoming first. And he never gets back up on that escalator searching for power and significance. And we see that as he goes all the way to the cross. We read about it in Philippians 2, verse 5 to 7. It says this, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being born in human likeness. Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. I mean, God taking the form of a slave. It's like no wonder Christianity is hard for people to believe sometimes. And this story of Jesus maybe just doesn't make sense. They come to a carol service and they hear, yes, that sounds familiar to us. God coming to a stable. And then the more you think about it, the more it doesn't make sense. Jesus had all the power in heaven, yet he emptied himself. And why? It was for his love for you and his love for me. It was his love for the oppressed. It was his love for the rich. It was his love for everybody which caused him to empty himself and to come and meet with us. Mary, she had so much to sing about, didn't she? There's so much to sing about. What amazing news that God was coming in humility to bring release to the captives, to bring hope to the hopeless. He was ready to break chains of injustice. Now, if we have my Boris Johnson slide up, that would be... Now, well, it's not a Boris Johnson slide, but we all know the story, okay? And I'm never sure whether talking about politics in a sermon is a good idea, but bear with me, because as I was preparing this sermon, the story came to mind. And we all know the Christmas parties of last year. And what I was fascinated about is thinking, why were people, or why was the whole country so angry about this? What was it about it that really angered us? We knew that, you know, everybody knew some people who were probably breaking the rules and... But the government, we want to hold them to a higher standard, right? They are the people that are making the laws. We wanted them to feel what those laws felt like for us, who were trying to obey those laws, yet here they were not doing it themselves. We wanted them to experience our isolation that we experienced, our cancelling of family engagements of seeing people, people who didn't even get to go to funerals or weddings. We wanted the government to feel that. And when we found out that they weren't not only feeling it, but that they were doing the opposite, that they were not even following their own rules, makes us cross, right? Because we wanted them to experience our experience. And this is what Jesus did. He came to experience the human condition He didn't look from afar. He came right down into that stable to be with us and to experience what we experienced, to experience isolation, to experience loneliness, to be able to understand what the hungry were experiencing, will they experience, to understand 
the persecuted church. You know, Jesus in his own persecution. There's so many experiences that he had that he can say, I understand how you feel. And this is what Jesus does as he's coming down the escalator. He's experiencing what we feel, not content to see the world, the world as it is, but coming to see it up close. And I could end the talk there because this is great news, right? God comes to meet us where we are. And no matter what we're going through, he is there and he understands and he loves us. But I want to ask this question. You can probably see where this is going. What way down or up the escalator of life are we traveling? Just to cement this image a little bit, I want us to think about disaster movies. I'm a big fan of disaster movies. Anybody? It's probably my, one of my favorite genres. Zoe agrees. She loves a disaster movie. So imagine you've got either, usually in a big city, maybe New York, which is often the place where disasters seem to happen and catastrophic events. Maybe you've got an alien invasion, or a comet's about to strike, or a big tsunami is about to happen, whatever it is, and then you get this classic image of everybody trying to get out as quickly as they can, giant queues. But then we usually have the hero of the story. They've maybe worked out the cure for a zombie apocalypse, or they found out the way to bring the aliens down. And in that moment of realization, they head back into the place where the catastrophe, the catastrophe is about to happen to go and rescue the day. Now, this is a picture, maybe, of Jesus coming down this escalator. It is coming into the place where nobody wants to go. It's coming to rescue us. And we might not be heroes of a disaster movie, but God is calling us to follow him. So I want you to imagine the escalator again. And imagine as Jesus is coming down, you can see maybe people coming down after him. Maybe just one or two at first. Maybe it might have been Mary, she had this realization. But he's, he's coming down and there are people following behind him. Are we willing to come down the escalator to empty ourselves, to put others first? to give up power when it's in our near grasp for the sake of the kingdom, to humble ourselves, to live lives of generosity. Now, when, um, I remember one time going to see my granddad and he told me this story and it was kind of heartbreaking, but I'm gonna mention it to you um, now because I thought, again, it was another really um, pertinent image of this downward movement. And it was a story for when he was in the Second World War as a soldier, and he was aboard a ship called the SS Challenger. On the 5th of July, 1941, a nearby ship called the Anselm was hit by a torpedo and began to sink. And the Challenger, the boat that my granddad was on, came alongside and they managed to pull 64 men out of the water. Now, the officers on these big ships, they used to often spend time on the deck and the men would be down below. And so the officers were able to get away. And one survivor says that they were getting away without any concern. I mean, they had concern, but they were more concerned for their lives than concerned for their men going down. But there was one officer. He was 42 years old. His name was Reverend Cecil Pugh. And when he heard the screams of the young men, many still in their teens, as this boat was going down and they were trapped in the hold, he asked some Royal Marines to lower him down on a rope. And they didn't want to do it because they knew he was going to his death. But he insisted and he said this, he said, my love of God is greater than my fear of death. And he wanted to be with his men as they were going down in their last minutes to be able to pray with them and bring them comfort. So they reluctantly did as he asked and they lowered him into the hold 
and he knelt and prayed with the trapped men, the seawater already up to his shoulders. And Anselm sank a few minutes later, and the Reverend Pew went down with the 250 young men. And afterwards, he was awarded the George Cross for ba bravery, and he was the only clergyman to ever receive such an honour. Now, my granddad wasn't a Christian, and he didn't really get very emotional on many occasions, but he would get choked up at this story, the story of someone who is willing to sacrifice his life, and he knew that he was a Christian. The story of someone who was willing to say, it seems pointless in the world's eyes, right? We think they're going down, whether they have comfort or not. Why bother? You're just wasting your life. But for him, this was his calling, was to be there in those last moments. Cecil Pugh knew that he was traveling down the escalator behind Jesus. He knew the direction that he was headed. The other people that I was thinking of was, you know, many of you remember John and Anne Hancock. You know, it's a dear couple in the congregation who spent their lives as, ministry, as missionaries, and they knew, they knew how to make that downward step, that just giving up of themselves to serve the Lord. So which way are you heading? Are you passing Jesus on your way up looking for significance? Or are you coming down? And this isn't necessarily in grand heroic gestures, but in bringing God's kingdom, that kingdom where the poor are given preference, where to serve is better than to be served, to bring light rather than darkness, hope to the hungry, to those suffering and oppressed. At Christmas, we celebrate this coming king, the coming of the one who made himself nothing, who humbled himself and emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant. But I have another piece of good news that you all know, that this isn't just a promise for something that happened in the past. The king is coming again, and he will come. And what he will do is he'll get rid of this escalator of life. There will be no more traveling up and down. There'll be no more seeking power or success. There'll there will be none of that. It will be gone. And what we'll be able to do instead is just to simply live with him forever. And this coming king, both in the incarnation and the future king to come, is good news. He's good news for everybody, for the poor and the rich, for the weak and the strong, for the humble and the proud. He's good news for everybody. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that in your coming, we have the grandest gesture anybody could ever make. Yet we have it from God himself. We thank you that you were willing to give up all the power of heaven, everything that you had to come to meet with us, to minister to the lowest of the low, to show how God loves every person in this world. And Lord, we ask that as we think about this and as we consider you at Christmas time, Lord, will you help us, help us to follow you in whatever that is. Help us in this call to, to give up of ourselves. Help us in this call to be humble like you, to prefer the needs of others, for ourselves to be lower and for you to be higher. Lord, we know it's not an easy, it's not an easy job. We know it's not an easy task as the human nature is just within us saying to make something of significance and of worth of ourselves. But Lord, we know that within you, with you, we have all the significance that we need. So we just ask that you'll help us, help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen.